challenge of the Yukon. <laughs> it's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the Northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King, on you husky. <laughs> gold, gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush with Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. Sergeant Preston was driving along the trail to Wolf Creek when he sighted a team heading toward him from the opposite direction. As the team drew closer, the sergeant recognized the driver as a sourdough named Bernie Mitchell. Looking for you, Husky. Hold on. Bernie's face was excited as he halted his dogs and jumped from the sled runners. Hey, fellow sergeant, I'm sure glad to see you. I thought I was have to go all the way to Dawson to get a hold of a Marty. What's wrong, Bernie? You know Joe Hopwood, the storekeeper at Wolf Creek, don't you? Well, of course. What about him? Well, he was shot to death last night. Huh? And all the gold in his safe was stolen. Any idea who did it? Well, the folks at Wolf Creek think it was Doug Leonard. Doug Leonard? Well, I know Doug. He's no killer. Of course he's no killer. I've been friends with that young fella ever since he staked his claim. And I wanted to bet he's not guilty. But the trouble is, there's evidence against him. What sort of evidence? Well, there was a handkerchief lying in front of the safe. It had Doug's initials on it. Is it really Doug's handkerchief? Yeah, he admits it belongs to him. But he claims he lost it about a week ago. What about the clerk who worked for Joe? Well, he wasn't there when it happened. He'd gone to Dawson to bring in supplies. Got back last night. He was the one who found the body. What's been done with Doug? Has he been taken prisoner? Yeah, they got him locked up in the stock room back at the store. We better not waste any time getting there. What do you mean? Well, that gold that was stolen didn't all belong to Joe. A lot of it belonged to the miners. They didn't like to keep it around their cabin, so they got Joe to store it in his safe. If they get stirred up against Doug... Well, there's no telling what may happen. Do they act as though they might take the law into their own hands? Well, they weren't acting yet, but just before I left town, I stopped off at the cafe, and there was a fellow there named Marcus Tate who was talking about lynching. Come on, Bernie. Got your team turned around. You bet, Sergeant. Gee, gee, you husky. All right, King. Up front, boy. On King. On you husky. At that same moment, back in the settlement on Wolf Creek, Ruth Leonard was just entering the general store. She was greeted by the clerk, Van Buckley. Hello there, Mrs. Leonard. I've brought some food for my husband. We've got him locked up in the storeroom. Oh, yes, I know, but you'll let me in to see him, won't you? Well, all right, I reckon that won't do any harm. Just a minute while I get the key. Oh, what are you doing with that gun? Just want to make sure he doesn't try to escape when I open the door. But you know Doug better than that. Surely you don't believe he's guilty. I'm sorry, Mrs. Leonard. All I know is that Doug's handkerchief was lying in front of the safe. Doug lost that handkerchief a week ago. I know that's what he says. Well, it's true, I tell you. Doug didn't leave the cabin last night, and what's more, his sled has a broken runner. So how could he have hauled away all that gold that was stolen? Well, I... I don't know what to think, Mrs. Buckley. I sure hope your husband is innocent. Just the same, I'm not taking any chances. All right, I suppose there's no use arguing. Come on, I'll take you back to the storeroom. Ruth, honey. Hello, darling. If you don't mind, I think I'd better lock the door. Oh, go ahead. When you're ready to go, you uh, knock on the door and I'll let you out. Gosh, I'm glad to see you, honey. Oh, you're not worried, are you, Doug? Of course I'm not worried. But I'd sure like to know how my handkerchief happened to be found at the scene of the crime. Well, whoever murdered Joe Hopwood must have planted it there. Yeah, if only I could prove that. Oh, Doug, listen. Bernie Mitchell has gone to Dawson to notify the Mounties. Yeah? He's going to try to get hold of Sergeant Preston. Oh, that's good news. If anyone can solve this case, Sergeant Preston is the man to do it. Hey, but say, what have you got in the basket? Oh, I brought you some food. <laughs> Beef stew. By golly, I thought I smelled something good. <laughs> Hope you haven't lost your appetite. <laughs> you just watch and see. Sometime later that afternoon, after Ruth Leonard had left, a miner named Marcus Tate entered the store. There was an odd look of expectancy on Van Buckley's face as Tate approached the counter. Well, how about it, Tate? Can Doug Leonard hear us? Not if we don't talk too loud. 
What took you so long? I thought we'd be seeing some action by this time. Yeah, yeah, so did I. But it looks like we're out of luck. Oh, what's the matter? I hung around the cafe for two, three hours trying to get things stirred up. Then I moseyed up and down the creek talking to every miner I ran into. But it didn't do a doggone bit of good. Well, they believe Leonard's guilty, don't they? Yeah, most of them do, but not all of them. Trouble is, Leonard's got a lot of friends. And all the miners have a heap of respect for his wife. Even the ones who think he's guilty don't take to the idea of lynching him without a fair trial. Especially after they found out about his sled runner being broke. That's not so good. And I'll tell the world it's not so good. We figured that handkerchief would be enough to get him strung up in short order. But it hasn't worked out that way. And now Bernie Mitchell has gone to Dawson to get the Mounties. Yeah, so I heard. Once those redcoats start poking around, there's no telling how many clues they'll turn up. Uh, they may even wind up pinning the murder on us. Do you realize that? Uh, maybe there's a way we can settle this whole business before the Mounties ever get here. You mean you got some kind of a scheme? Yeah. Um, and I think this one ought to work out for sure. Well, for Pete's sake, let's hear it. All right, here's what I got in mind. Suppose you come around tonight sometime after I close up the store. We'll tell Leonard that the miners are all stirred up. They're forming a lynch mob. They're apt to come here and get him any minute. You're going. In order to save his neck, we'll tell him he'd better clear out. You say you'll take him to a cave you know of out in the woods and guard him till Bernie Mitchell gets back from Dawson with the Mounties. Which won't be till sometime late tomorrow. And then what happens? After you leave, I'll give myself a bump on the head. Enough to make a bruise so it'll look as though Leonard knocked me out. And I'll wait for a half hour or so and spread the alarm. I'll say Leonard got hold of a gun and made a getaway. And what am I supposed to be doing in the meantime? As soon as you get Leonard out in the woods, put a bullet through his head and bring his body back to town. You can say you met up with him while he was making his getaway. He pulled a gun on you, so you shot him in self-defense. There's just one thing wrong with your plan. Now, what's that? Leonard has no gun, and there's no way to explain how he got hold of one. That's where you're wrong. There is a way to explain. Well, then explain it to me. A little while ago, Leonard's wife came here with a basket of food for him. There must have been half a dozen guys hanging around out in front of the store who can testify to that. Who's to know but what she had a gun hidden in that basket? Yeah. <laughs> By thunder, Buckley, I gotta hand it to you. That's a plenty smart plan. When people hear how Leonard slugged his way out of here, they're bound to think he's guilty. And not only that, you'll plant a gun in his possession to back up our story. Sure. Just leave it to me, Buckley. The plan's a cinch to work out. Meanwhile, Sergeant Preston and Bernie Mitchell were urging their teams forward at top speed over the hard-packed trail. As the sun dropped below the horizon and the short Arctic day began closing in, they were still a considerable distance from Wolf Creek. Finally, the sergeant called a halt. Okay. Hiya, Husky. Hello. What's wrong, Sergeant? If we leave the trail here and cut through the hills and across the lake, we can save several miles. Yeah, I reckon so. But we may find it rough going. Besides, the ice on the lake's getting mushy. It could be dangerous. We'll have to chance it. Yeah, Dad, ready do you suppose we'll get there in time? I don't know. It's getting dark, which means the miners will soon be quitting work and heading for the cafe. Yeah. If there's going to be trouble, that's when it's likely to come. Well, boy, Sunday, if they lynch Doug, that poor cat Tate ought to be strung up myself. No use getting worked up now, Bernie. We'll just have to travel fast and hope for the best. Come on, let's mush. Right, Sergey. Harking! Ha, you husky! Hunking! Hun, you husky! That night, Doug Leonard was just dozing off in the storeroom when he heard the door being unlocked. A second later, Van Buckley and Marcus Tate came into the room. They looked tense and excited. What's that? Plenty. The miners are all stirred up about you killing Joe Hopwood and stealing the gold. I tell you I'm innocent. It don't matter whether you're innocent or not. They think you're guilty and that's all that counts. A bunch of the boys down at the cafe are forming a lynch mob right now. A lynch mob? That's what I said. They're getting ready to string you up higher than Haman. Holy mackerel. You're going to have to clear out of here, Doug. It's the only way you can save your neck. Yeah, but where'll I go? Tate's got his sled and dog team waiting out back of the store. He'll take you out in the woods. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I know a cave where you can hide out till the Mounties get here. By thunder, that's mighty wide of you, Tate. Well, never mind thanking me. Just get your park on. Let's get going. Right. Meanwhile, Sergeant Preston and Bernie Mitchell were rapidly approaching Wolf Creek. About half an hour after Doug had left with Marcus Tate, they arrived in the settlement and halted their teams in front of the general store. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. Come on, Bernie. Yeah, it looks like Buckley is closed up for the night, eh? Yes. There's a light through the shutters. Keeping him. Oh, wait a minute. I think I hear someone coming. Yeah, he's coming, all right. As Van Buckley opened the door, they saw him sway dizzily and clutch at the door frame for support. 
There was a livid bruise on his forehead. Sergeant Preston. Holy smoke, Buckley. What happened to you? Here, you'd better let me help you to a chair. Thanks. Take him what you got here. What happened? Doug Leonard has escaped. Escaped? How'd it happen? He was locked up in the storeroom. A while ago, I heard him rap on the door to attract my attention. When I asked him what he wanted, he told me he was feeling awful sick, so I opened up. Then he shoved a gun in my ribs. Didn't anyone search him before he was locked up? Oh, sure, he was searched all right. He had no gun at that time. I know that for a fact. And where'd he get the gun? There's only one possible answer, Sergeant. He, his wife came here today, brought him a basket of food. She must have had the gun hidden in that basket. All right, go on with your story. Well, there's not much more to tell. He made me get my hands up. And he swung the gun at me all of a sudden. Knocked me out. Any idea how long you were unconscious? Oh, I don't think it was very long. I remember it was close to 9 o'clock when he rapped on the door. Well, let's see. It's 26 after 9 right now. In other words, he escaped about a half an hour ago. Where's the storeroom? It's back here. I'll show you. Here it is. What are you going to do? See if King can pick up his scent. Did he use this blanket at all? Uh, yeah, he was lying on it part of the time. Here, King. <laughs> fine, boy, fine. <laughs> You think King will be able to trail him? Yes, I'm sure of it. He has the scent. Well, boy, thank you, Sergeant. If you're going after Doug, I'm going with you. All right, Bernie, let's go. After leaving the general store, Doug and Marcus Tate had headed northward along a narrow trail which penetrated deep into the forest that bordered Wolf Creek. Doug was riding the sled while Tate handled the team. For some time, neither man had spoken when Tate suddenly shouted to the Huskies. Oh, oh there you Huskies. Oh. What are we stopping here for? There's no cave around here, is there? I wouldn't know about that, Leonard. Get up off the sled. Well, what's it? Hey, what's the idea of the gun? I said get up off the sled. What are you going to do? I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to put a bullet right through your heart. I don't get this. It doesn't make sense. I thought you were taking me out here to save me from a lynch mob. Sure, that's what we told you. But it was just a trick. A trick? That's right. There was no lynch mob. We just told you that story so you'd come along peaceable like. The fact of the matter is, Buckley's going to say you got hold of a gun and escaped. When the miners hear that, they'll all be convinced you're guilty. Wait a minute. Now I'm beginning to understand. It must have been you and Buckley who framed me in the first place. And it was you two who killed Joe Hopwood. <laughs> hey, you catch on fast, Leonard. Sure, it was me and Buckley who killed Hopwood. And after I cleared out with the gold, Buckley spread that cock and bull story about coming back to the store and finding his boss dead. Yeah, but what about my handkerchief? How did you get hold of that? It so happens you lost that handkerchief at the store. Dropped out of your pocket one day when you went to pay the bill. Buckley found it, and that's what gave him the idea of framing you. We As Doug kept Tate talking, his mind was working at a feverish pace. Suddenly a plan occurred to him, a plan that offered a slim ray of hope. You and Buckley are mighty smart, Tate. But even though you get away with Hopwood's murder, you can't get away with killing me. What makes you think not? Because there's no one you can frame for my murder. <laughs> We won't have to frame anybody. You see, I'm going to claim I met up with you accidentally while you were making your getaway. I say you pulled a gun on me, so I had to plug you in, in self de Hey, what do you keep looking over my shoulder for all the time? Oh, I, I wasn't looking over your shoulder. Oh, yes, you were. I suppose you're trying to make me think someone's sneaking out in back of me, Don't huh? be a fool. How could anyone sneak up in back of you without you hearing him? Hey, Thunder, you're up to something, Leonard. I reckon I better plug you Grab right. him, Bernie! Hey, what the... In spite of himself, Tate was thrown off guard by Doug's gun. sudden shout. Instantly, Doug sprang at him, grabbing his gun arm. For several moments, the two men struggled desperately. And then suddenly, the gun went off. With a groan, Tate collapsed in the snow. Doug stared at him, wide-eyed and horror-stricken. I've killed him. A terrible realization swept over Doug's mind. Who would believe his version of what had happened? Especially after Buckley had spread word that he escaped from the store at gunpoint. Instead of being accused of one murder, he would now be accused of two. I've got to get away from here. Almost instinctively, <laughs> Doug picked up the gun which had fallen from Tate's hand. He stuffed it in the pocket of his parka. And then he ran toward the sled and grabbed hold of the handlebars. <laughs> Mush! Mush, you huskies! Mush! Urging the team forward at top speed, Doug continued along the same trail for about half a mile. And then he turned off on a branch trail which would take him to his own cabin. When he arrived there a short time later, a light in the window told him that Ruth was still awake. Ho, ho, who down, boys? Ho. Doug. Doug, what's happened? Tell me. I just killed a man. Killed a man? 
Oh, no, I don't believe it. It's true, I tell you, honey. Oh, not Van Buckley. No, no, Marcus Tate. Oh, for heaven's sake, darling. <laughs> Sit down and tell me the whole story. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tate came to the store tonight. He and Buckley told me that a mob was forming in the cafe. A lynch mob. They told me I'd have to clear out in order to save my neck. You mean Buckley let you go free? Yeah, yeah, but it was just a trick. A trick? That's right, honey. He and Tate cooked it up between them. And what's more, they killed Joe Hopwood. Oh, Doug, are you sure? Sure, I'm sure, the dirty skunks. Wait till I tell you what happened. Tate said he'd take me out to a cave he knew of. A place where I could hide out till things quieted down. But after we got up in the woods a ways, he pulled a gun on me. But why? To kill me, that's why. Don't you see, honey, Buckley's gonna say I escaped from the store. That'll convince everyone that I'm guilty. Then Tate was gonna claim that he met up with me in the woods. That I pulled a gun and he had to shoot in self-defense. Oh, you still haven't told me what happened. Well, after Tate pulled the gun, I grappled with him. And the gun went off accidentally. And killed Tate? That's right. I, I left him lying back in the woods. Oh. oh, Doug, this whole thing is a nightmare. It's worse than a nightmare, honey. This is real. Before, I had a chance of convincing the Mounties that I'm innocent. But now, if they catch me, I'm certain to hang. The scent was fresh. And with King leading the way, Sergeant Preston and Bernie Mitchell soon arrived at the spot where the shooting had taken place. They saw a man's body sprawled in the snow. Okay. Hey, holy mackerel. Marcus Tate. Marcus Tate. And this is the man who was talking against Doug at the cafe this morning. Yeah, that's right, Sergeant. You suppose Doug shot him? Looks that way, Bernie. There's only one other set of footprints in the snow besides Tate's. Chances are they're Doug's. Is he dead? No, his pulse is still beating. Bullet went through his shoulder. The sergeant took a small flask of brandy from his sled and forced a little between the wounded man's lips. <laughs> Tate's eyes flickered momentarily. Then he lost consciousness again. He's in a state of shock. I'll put a bandage on his wound. Bernie Mitchell watched as the sergeant attended to the wounded man. I, Sunday, I still can't believe that Doug is a killer. There are a lot of things about this case that don't ring true, Bernie. What do you mean? Well, for one thing, why didn't Doug tie Buckley or lock him in the storeroom before he made his getaway? Well, maybe he didn't think it was necessary. After all, he had knocked him unconscious. Yes, but how long could Doug count on him staying that way? Buckley might have come to a minute later and spread the alarm. By golly, that's true. Another thing that seems strange is the fact that he hit Buckley on the forehead. Uh, what's strange about that? A well, natural thing would have been to make his victim turn around before hitting him. That way, there'd be no danger of Buckley grabbing his arm and putting up a fight. Gee, you don't suppose Buckley was telling us a pack of lies, do you? I don't know what to make of it, Bernie. The oddest thing of all is that Tate and Doug were traveling together. How do you figure that out? You can see for yourself there's only one set of sled tracks. Gee, that's right. Well, doggone, this sure beats me. <laughs> Bandage will do for the time being. Going to put him on your sled, Bernie. Right, I'll take his feet. <coughs> what do you want me to do, Sergeant? Take him back to the store. Yeah? Buckley will have what's needed to dress the wound properly. In the meantime, King and I will follow Doug's trail. Okay, Sergeant. Good luck to you. Thanks, Bernie. All right, boy. Up front. Line the thing. Line him up, Buck. On King. On Buck. Push. Push, you husky. Push. When Bernie arrived back at the store, he lifted Tate from the sled and carried him inside. Van Buckley greeted him with a look of open-mouthed astonishment. What? Why, well, that's Tate you're carrying. Hey, sure, it's Tate. Who does he look like? Come on, give me a hand with him, eh? Huh? Yeah, yeah, sure. <clears throat> Where do we put him? In the back room. Uh, lay him down here in the bunk. What in blazes happened? Oh, he found him on the trail. Someone had plugged him. It must have been Doug Leonard. Yeah, I reckon so. What about Sergeant Preston? Well, he's still following up Doug's trail. He told me to bring Tate back here to the store. Is he badly wounded? It could have been worse. He was drilled through the shoulder. Sergeant Preston put on temporary bandage, but the wound still has to be dressed. The sergeant figured he ought to have what was needed here at the store. Sure, I have antiseptic and bandages. All right, get him out. Start heating some water. We'll see if we can't get this fellow patched up proper. Doug Leonard sat at the table in his cabin with his head propped up in his hands. Ruth was bending over him sympathetically. Doug, you've got to give yourself up. It's the only way. I tell you, I can't, honey. If I do, I'm sure to be convicted. Well, if you don't, it'll be taken as an admission of guilt. What difference does that make? No one will ever believe my story now. 
Buckley will claim I escaped from the store to avoid hanging. And it'll look as though I shot Tate when he tried to stop me from making a getaway. Oh, I haven't got a chance. But if you don't give yourself up, what are you going to do? You don't want to be hunted for the rest of your life. I'd rather be hunted than hanged. I shouldn't even be here now. The minute Buckley spreads the alarm, this is the first place they'll come looking for me. Get your hands up, Doug. Oh, Doug. Sergeant Preston. Don't reach for that gun. I don't want to have to shoot you. I'll back away from the table. That's better. Now then, I have your gun, so you may put your hands down. Oh, I... I suppose you've come to arrest me? I may arrest you eventually. First, I want to hear your story of what happened tonight. All right. You won't believe me, but what I'm going to tell you is the truth, Sergeant. In the first place, I didn't escape from the store, as Buckley has no doubt told you. He and Tate tricked me into going. Tricked you? How? By telling me the miners were all stirred up and a mob was coming to lynch me. Tate offered to take me out to a cave he knew of where I could hide out temporarily. I see. What happened after you and Tate got out in the woods? Uh, he pulled a gun on me. He said he was going to kill me and then claim he had to shoot in self-defense. By luck, I managed to catch him off guard. We grappled for the gun and... Well, it, it went off and Tate was killed. No, Doug, you're wrong. But, wrong? What do you mean? Tate wasn't killed. He was only wounded. What? Doug! Are you sure of that? Of course I'm sure. I bandaged his wound. Oh, Doug, isn't that wonderful? Oh, I can hardly believe it. And I... I suppose you don't believe the story I've just told you, do you, Sergeant? On the contrary, Doug, I do believe it. It's the only explanation that accounts for all the facts. But what about the murder of Joe Hopwood? Tate have anything to say about that? He admitted that he and Van Buckley had done it. That's why they staged this business tonight. They wanted to convince everyone I was guilty. I suppose they planted your handkerchief in front of the safe. Yeah, that's right, Sergeant. Mm. It turned out I'd lost it at the store and Buckley found it. That's what gave him the idea of framing me. I see. Sergeant, does this mean Doug may go free? Well, I can't guarantee that just yet, Ruth. Even though I believe Doug's story, the miners may want him brought to trial. Aside from what Tate told Doug, which of course he'd deny in court, we have no definite proof that he and Buckley are guilty. Oh, what sort of proof can we possibly get? The most convincing proof would be to find the stolen gold in their possession. They must have hidden it away somewhere. Well, they won't have it lying around out in the open, that's for sure. But I think there's a good chance that Tate may have some of it at his cabin. Well, why Tate? Because no one had any reason to connect him with the robbery. Therefore, he'd be taking no risk in keeping the gold at his cabin. See, stop to think of it, I'll bet you're right. When Tate was spouting off to me, he mentioned that he cleared out with the gold before Buckley spread the news of Joe's murder. Get your park on, Doug. We'll go search his cabin right now. Right, Sergeant. After helping Buckley attend to the wounded man, Bernie Mitchell left the general store and headed for the Leonard's cabin, intending to report the news of the night's events to Mrs. Leonard. Meanwhile, Tate had recovered consciousness. As soon as Bernie had gone, Buckley said, Now, for Pete's sake, tell me what really happened. When I went to shoot Leonard, he put up a fight. Grabbed hold of my gun hand. While we were wrestling around, the gun went off and I got plugged. You stupid jughead, what's wrong with you? You had the drop on him, didn't you? Well, sure, but he caught me off guard. Oh, you really messed up this deal for us. When Preston catches up with Leonard, that guy's gonna talk his head off. Well, let him talk. No one's gonna believe his story. How do you know what they'll believe? Suppose Preston gets suspicious and comes snooping around your cabin. Holy mackerel, I, I never thought about that. Well, start thinking about it. We better get that gold out of their pronto. Find some other place to hide it. You feel strong enough to make it down the creek to your cabin? Uh, not on foot, I don't, but I reckon I'll be all right if you take me there on your sled. All right, let's get going. As Van Buckley and Marcus Tate left the general store, the sergeant and Doug were just arriving at Tate's cabin. Okay. Oh, 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 oh. Come on, Doug, we'll go inside. Right. Must have a lamp around here somewhere. Oh, there's a lamp on the table. Wait a second. The sergeant struck a match and lit the lamp. As the soft glow of the oil flame dispelled the darkness, the two men looked around at the interior of the cabin. Where do you suppose he'd hide the gold? No telling, Doug. Only ways to go over the cabin foot by foot. How are we going at it? Doesn't make any difference. Suppose you take one half of the cabin, I'll take the other. All right, sergeant. I'll cover this half. The two men began making a thorough search for the stolen gold. It was Sergeant Preston who finally discovered where the loot had been hidden. I think I found it, Doug. Where? Wood box? Yes, hidden away under these logs. Good for you, Sergeant. There must be at least a dozen folks in here. I'll open one of them. Uh, chock full of gold dust. Yes, the evidence we were looking for. Here, put this poke on the table and I'll pull out the others. Right. Reach, both of you. It's Buckley and Tate. That's right. And we're each holding guns. Well, well, this is an unexpected pleasure. Don't mention it, Preston. The pleasure's all ours. So, you found out where we had the gold hidden, huh? Yes, it wasn't too difficult. 
little imagination, you could have found a much better hiding place. <sighs> Too bad for you we didn't. Because now we're going to have to get rid of both of you. I take it you're admitting that you killed Joe Hopwood. Sure, why not? You'll never get a chance to arrest us for the murder. Who knows? Maybe you're right. But I can promise you this. No matter where you go or how much you try to cover up your crime, the Northwest Mountain... As the sergeant kept the crook's attention focused on himself, he could see King out of the corner of his eye, moving cautiously along the wall. You're mighty sure of yourself, aren't you, Preston? Yes, you'll soon know why. Take him, King! As Buckley went down under King's attack, he knocked against the other crook's wounded shoulder. With a gasp of pain, Tate swerved to fire at King. But the sergeant's gun flashed out of its holster. Oh, my hand! Stand right where you are, Tate. Call off this dog! Get him away from me! Oh. Pick up the guns, Doug, while I keep them covered. Right, Sergeant. I have him. All right, King. On guard, boy. Get up on your feet, Buckley. And both of you back up against that wall. I'm arresting you in the name of the Crown for the murder of Joe Hopwood. Sergeant, that was some shooting, the way you blasted that gun out of Tate's hand. I wouldn't have had a chance to shoot if it hadn't been for King. Uh, believe me, I'm mighty grateful to both of you. You cleared me of a murder charge, and King saved our lives. Not the first time he saved my life, Doug, and it probably won't be the last. However, we've captured the real killers of Joe Hopwood, and we have the evidence we need to convict them, which means that this case is closed. In our next adventure... Two men are talking just outside the general store in Selkirk. Hey, Smitty, that Frenchman in the store was boasting about all the fine furs he had stored away up at his place. Well, what about it? We're going to trail him to his place. We'll grab those furs while he's sleeping, then head for Whitehorse, where we'll be able to sell them. Now let's get back out of sight so he won't see us when he leaves. Robbing the simple Frenchman of his furs seems like an easy job to the two crooks. But if Sergeant Preston and King hear about it and try to trail them, it may mean they'll face death at the hands of two desperate men. Be sure to hear this exciting adventure next Saturday. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created by George W. Trendle, produced by Trendle Campbell Enterprises, directed by Fred Flowerday, and supervised by Charles D. Livingston. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you every Saturday and Sunday. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye and good luck until next Saturday. This program came from Detroit. Today's most popular heroes of outdoor adventure are heard every weekday afternoon from 5 to 6 o'clock. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, Mark Trail roams the wilderness. Clyde Beatty defies the beasts of the jungle. And Victor Borga entertains with five minutes of musical laughs. Tuesday and Thursday, there are the Indian hero Straight Arrow riding to uphold justice. Sky King zooming to supersonic action. And Bobby Benson, the cowboy kid, in tales of western daring. Listen to Mutual's Hour for Fun with Mark Trail, Clyde Beatty, Victor Borga, Straight Arrow, Sky King, and Bobby Benson over most of these stations every weekday afternoon. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.